All right, we are live. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. I hope you got great questions today as you're checking in. Uh, we're going to go live at the top of the hour. We'll get everybody on here. Bring in my man, my man, Steve. Say hello to everybody, Steve. What's going on, guys? Good to be on with live with you guys. Hopefully, uh, everyone's got some good questions, and we got a we got a rocking panel here, a uh, bunch of experts. Uh, to can't wait to hear what they have to say as well. So hopefully, you're you're pumped and excited, as excited as we are. Absolutely. All right, back to the countdown. Here we go. See if I can get some music rocking here. Hoping everybody's uh, Thanksgivings were awesome. It was great. Made some. Yeah, I, was, I was telling. I was telling uh, Fen because Fen's got on his bio um, that um, he's never met a brownie that that uh, he's he's never liked. And I said I will neither confirm nor deny how many brownies I had last night. So true. <laughs> so true. Love Apple them. pie. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. You're live. You. Yep. We're, we're All right. Here. I said we're apple pie. We must, here. must not have apple pie lover. I wasn't sure if it was my microphone or nobody liked apple pie. <laughs> I'm definitely love apple pie. A little, a little a la mode going on there. A little white uh, your vanilla ice cream. You yeah, know? you got it. Slightly heated up. Hey, Michael. Glad to see you. So there's a there's a a private chat here. We are live right now. So everything we are saying is live. So I just want to put this out there for everybody. A uh, little, little more than a minute and a half before the top of the hour when we really get into it and Steve starts introducing everybody. Uh, if there's something you want to jump in on live, just uh, hit that private chat and uh, let me know and I'll make sure you, you pop up on the screen solo style. All right. Great. Sounds and just, uh, just to make it easy for everybody when we're not talking, you can put yourself on mute just to, to follow the good uh, video gu conference guidelines. Sounds good. I know we got some people watching. Where are you checking in from? Please let me know. And for everybody that's presenting, I'm putting into the private chat the link for the the live. So just make sure that's on mute, um, so that you're not uh, echo chambering when you unmute to talk. Steve, you ready, brother? I am as ready as I ever will be, sir. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm very excited. This is going to be awesome. Uh, we got so many great minds uh, to talk about this. Um, I'm hoping that everybody that's watching uh, is excited to um, to uh, really uh, dig in on how to follow up. Steve is going to get into it. He's going to introduce our folks right now. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome to LinkedIn Live Master Connection Series. Uh, Steve and Cameron coming at you guys. Um, so we have a distinguished panel. Uh, you know, we could go probably 45 minutes and, and introduce each one of these folks, but I'm uh, just going to kind of give a, a real quick, uh, you know, sentence on each person. Um, and we really appreciate their time. And so uh, in, in no particular order, we have Mr. Chris San uh, Salem, uh, business coach and speaker uh, extraordinaire. Um, we've also got uh, Keith Reynolds, an author and speaker, and and uh, he's uh, he's got an incredible background on uh, how to uh, transform your business uh, into social media and and so forth, and great great knowledge there. Uh, Mr. Rob Mark Pecha, uh, also known as Rob uh, Ten Thirty One Rob, uh, and he's an exchange specialist uh, and an avid networker. He's a big networker for sure. That's for sure. I see him everywhere. Um, we have Mr. Fenton Joseph, uh, Avala Branch Digital. He is a, as we like to say, a whisper, a brand whisperer, uh, and also a web, web web developer, SEO expert, 
uh, men of many, many talents, um, as well as Michael Ferraro, uh, real estate um, uh, investor um, and a marketer. And, and he has a interest, very interesting uh, entrepreneurial background as well. Uh, I don't think uh, Amanda has joined us quite yet, right? No, not yet. Okay. Well, if she does, we could always give a quick bio on her. So that's who we got so far. We're excited to talk about the power of follow up and follow through and how it's really benefited all of us. And, and so I'll turn this back over to you, Kim. Yeah, absolutely. So we want to go through this. We want to get a little bit uh, to start things off and, and uh, give that value here for everybody. Uh, please uh, talk to us. Um, let us know how you follow up. So you are, we're, we're talking today about really connecting with folks and how you uh, continue to nurture that relationship and follow up. Uh, I'm just going to go in order of, of the folks on my screen here. Uh, Christopher, you want to jump in and uh, let us know how you follow up and, and really connect with folks and stay connected with them. Well, absolutely, Cameron. And thank you, Steve and Cameron, for having me on the panel. Great group of people here. So in terms of follow up, I'm a strong believer that, you know, when you're looking to connect with people, people connect subconsciously on shared values. Now, a lot of times we may not realize that consciously. So being a advocate of this and something I teach with a lot of my executive coaching clients, it's a, it's getting a, a, a understanding of what those values to the best of your ability may be with that person you're following up with. So like for me, I'm very transparent, I'm honest, integrity. Those are the values that represent who I am. Now, other people I'm following up with may not have the same values. They may have shared similar values. So more or less, I'm looking to connect with them there because why I'm doing that is in exchange as where I'm making an introduction or I'm just, you know, just, you know, meeting them for the first time. I'm looking to see how I can relate and understand them so they feel that from me. So when I'm doing the follow up, it makes it easier where they feel like they can trust me, even though they may not know me that well at that point to do the follow-up. So how I do that is, again, getting a better an understanding of where they come from, what are those values that could represent who they are. And I usually will reach out by uh, LinkedIn or email. And it's not something to, you know, again, just try to you know go into for the sale or whatever I'm getting to, you know, setting up a meeting to uh, talk to them about, but it's getting to know them. So it's really always about what's compelling to them that would be part of that follow-up, especially in the beginning. That's beautiful. All right, uh, Rob, you want to jump in here? Sure, you bet. And again, thanks, Cameron, and thanks, Steve, for the invite. Proud to be here with you guys. Hope everybody had a nice Thanksgiving. Yeah, so in terms of follow-up, so one of the key things that I focus on is uh, trying to home in on, on what the client or the COI or whoever you're trying to contact resonates with the best, right? So there are multiple mediums that we can use, cell phones, landlines, emails, all kinds of apps and text features. Different people resonate with different things better. So I have clients that never respond over email, for example, but always pick up the phone or vice versa, never respond over the phone, but respond well over email. So it's trying to home in on that very quickly so that you can keep those lines of communication going because there is no roadmap for everybody out there. You have a lot of things at your disposal now, apps, computer tech, and it's really a matter of getting to learn that very quickly because that keeps the lines of communication going, I find uh, as fluid as possible. So that'd be my, my tip. Hey, we got we got folks coming in. All right, so Keith, jump in here. Absolutely. Hi. My uh, probably two top are ways of, of getting in touch and staying in touch are by uh, volunteering in the community. I've been uh, head of programming for the AMA and Stanford Innovation Week, and I work with the Stanford Partnership, and I am on the board of the Stanford Symphony. So being out in the community is really important. And then uh, bringing people into events and meeting them and then using social media and email and uh, our CRM to, to keep in touch. And I guess the other way is uh, I love to write and post to my blog and that always you know, sparks good in, uh, conversations with people. And it's you know, really all about creating those connecting points and then staying in touch. I love that. All right, Fenton, jump in here. And I know we're gonna have to stick a pen in the CRM uh, conversation. I think that's going to be a big deal for anybody that um, has really jumped into that or is thinking about jumping into that. Go ahead, Fenton. Critical. 
Sure. So thanks for having me. Uh, two, two things. First, I always try to remember that no one cares about me. <laughs> They've got so many things going on in their lives. And when I think about my life as a business person and as a parent, I forget about people all the time. So first things first is I don't take it personal. And that helps me to just feel comfortable being in attack mode and constantly following up on a regular basis and not feeling bad like I'm bombarding somebody. If you spent time in sales, then you've probably realized that you should be reaching out as frequently as you possibly can. You're not going to upset people. They'll tell you when they don't want to hear from you anymore. So make sure that you're constantly in attack mode. And like Rob said, whether it's via email or text message or cell phone, you figure out what that medium is. And since there is no particular best way to reach people, um, similar to what uh, the first gentleman said, I try to be memorable, right? And if you want to be memorable, think of it like this. You've got to give people something that's a part of you that they can take away from the conversation to remember you by, which means you have to be your genuine self. You have to be authentic. You need to be bold and you need to give them something that will keep you top of mind so that when uh, the opportunity presents itself, that meaningful connection that you created by being your authentic self is going to resonate with them. And it makes the follow-up a lot easier. I love that. Michael, jump in here. Well, the tough part about being later on in this list when you call on me is that there's so many great people ahead of me that a lot of it, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta go, okay, well, that's perfect. Well, they in my business, the real estate business, especially in the real estate sales business, uh, they say it, everybody knows it, uh, the money is in the follow-up, right? The reason why you say that is because that is such a foundational spoke to our business. But to give this conversation for me a little context, let's take high-end real estate, real estate sales. The context that I would be speaking of in my follow-up is you have a prospect or a client that is in need of a service you provide. We provide white, we provide white glove service. So they might be in for context of the conversation, uh, follow-up needed for a property uh, or looking for a property. Well, it depends on where they are in that process, depends on how they consume content. It depends on um, how much I want to give them of service right in front of them. So if you have somebody who is interested in, let's say, a property, you go right into service mode without pushing a little bit too hard or too fast onto let's go see some properties, understanding where they are and blending yourself into their um, problem solution um, time is important because then you know where to follow up or how much to follow up, put them into CRM and stuff like that. So I guess um, just go right into service and then everything that everybody else says, but the follow up is the money. That's awesome. So I want to use the power in the room. I know that the folks watching are going to have some questions, but it takes some time for people to sort of warm up and sort of figure it out. So to sort of get that conversation going, I want to go back to the CRM piece. When should, you know, especially for a small business or an entrepreneur, when should they move from, you know, in mail, inbox? And there was a great article this week about the to-do list and how the to-do list really um, probably isn't effective until you're putting that on your calendar. And I think that's something that's just like a secret tip for follow-up, making sure that that follow-up date, you know, once you've made that great connection and, and you guys really uh, went in there and finding the interest, making sure you know what's going on, but then setting that date on the calendar to follow up for, with folks. Um, so talk to me about when you go from, or when it makes sense to go from, you know, you got your, your calendar on your computer or your physical calendar to something like a CRM. Um, where do you guys sort of sit on that? What what do you push to a sort of a automated thing or what do you try to automate versus what you try to do annually? Who wants to jump in there first on that one? Uh, I'll just say, I guess when, you know, for me, I, again, I, I'm all about being compelling first compared to being what's unique about me. Like, uh, Fenton said before, you know, what people don't care about you until you give them a reason to. It's about them first. So, so in terms of you know anything, when I set something on the calendar again, what I'm doing is I'm I'm looking to provide anything that I know about that person or company at that point in time within my control to provide any type of content that would be of value to them, whether if that's direct or indirect something I can put out there, not on a consistent basis, but, you know, something at least a few times a week. 
And then again, setting a, a time within a reasonable period of time from when you made that connection to do, you know, to, to, to do the next call and then follow up from there. I always find that the more questions that I can ask, the better when I empower them to now be able to talk and share more information. It just makes my job a lot easier later uh, through continuous follow-ups to get to the point of, of the sale or closing business to move forward. So it's a combination of, of putting out content that's relevant to what, what, why and what they do, their values. And again, that's compelling. And again, just you know, following up in a reasonable period of time and being and setting that date to be firm when you do uh, contact them and using questions, a lot of questions. Can I? Yeah, can I absolutely. Comment? So, wh who was jumping in? Me, if I could. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Michael. Um, and again, just to put everything into to context. So, in, in my opinion, this is what I also tell all my agents: follow up is all about the secret to follow up being successful at it is timing. If you can be the right person providing the right information or right um, uh, authority at the right time to the right person, that's a really powerful day at the office with follow up. So what, what I do. Look, so what does that look like? How do you how do you manage the right time? So what I do is in my CRM, and this is what me and my team, my assistant, all are working on in our database. In real estate, you're meeting people every single day. They can get lost in the shuffle. So my database has an A group, a B group, a C group. Um, the A group, the B group, the C group depending on where they are in the process of our relationship. Some people are current uh, clients, some people are past clients, some people are prospects and networking people. The job is to move from people from the, uh, the outside group all the way to the we're doing current business or even into the past client relationship. Every one of those groups has different content that's being sent to them and different timing in which how much, how often and when they get it. And depending on how the relationship is evolving, is going to be able to place them in the right time to really see the right information for them to then basically engage in my uh, output. So some of those people in some of those groups will be getting automated material because we haven't quite moved. So that, that goes to like the CRM question. So are you using a CRM to manage all this? You have to. I don't know how. I, I don't. I don't think you could do a pen and paper. Although I do have a lot of paper laying around here. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, what Michael's really getting at, you know, regarding the segmentation, you know, of, uh, you know, the different audience members is not only like super underutilized by most business people, because most people, business people aren't professional marketers. You know, you're a chef, you sell widgets, you do whatever. But when you get into marketing, you have to start to segment because you have to understand that different people have different needs, like Michael was saying. So using your CRM. I mean, I don't want to be redundant with what Michael said, but I think it's worth stating again, honestly, that different people need to get different pieces of messaging based on where they are in your funnel. Absolutely. So if they're complete strangers to your brand, they're getting awareness pieces. And if they've engaged with those awareness pieces and they're following you now, they should get something that's going to push them a little bit more, you know, towards, you know, uh, the point of conversion. Um, and then you have people that are customers that have uh, needs in terms of getting uh, staying in the loop and receiving messaging that keeps them buying more and more. And then there's the, the last phase, which is the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, the, the champions of your brand, if you will, the people that'll go out and tell other people how delighted they are with your services. And like you said, the only way to do that is with the CRM. I have very basic needs. So I use an Excel spreadsheet for the most part. Uh, I know when I speak to people, they probably need a website and it's a matter of where they are timing. Like Michael said, are they ready? Do they have the budget? Are we talking about picking up in the top of the new year? Um, so for me, it's pretty straightforward. I use a spreadsheet, but you may need a complicated uh, and comprehensive CRM. I think that question of scale is really important because when you're dealing with more than one or two salespeople uh, and your business is really focused on generating leads to keep the growth going, uh, you, you can use, it's not just a CRM, Today, your marketing automation with your landing pages and your drip email and your social media is all tied into your uh, sales activities. And so um, I've just spent the last uh, four months setting up SharpSpring. And now my website is more like a retail operation. It includes my social media and my uh, live events. It includes the uh, people who are coming to visit the website. It includes the people who are downloading things and it then plops them into email tracks 
based on their their behavior and their activity. So it, it's very hard to maintain that uh, level of integration and, and to use uh, tools like what, whatever, HubSpot, Pardot, um, SharpSpring, you know, name the name your your product, but uh, to do it uh, when you have more than one or two salespeople is critical. So it really depends on sort of the scale that you operate at. So let me hey, Cameron, I, because I think it would be valuable to go around the room. I'll, I'll, I'll do this uh, first, and I'll let you go, Steve. Um, can we just go around really quickly and talk about who uses a CRM versus who doesn't? And the one thing I'll mention because I'm still in that process of moving. Uh, pivoting to a new type of business, understanding that I didn't utilize uh, all the tools available to me in the last nine years of Toth Event Staffing, which is my business founded in 2011. Uh, I don't have a CRM uh, aside from uh, QuickBooks. And I noticed one of the things that I didn't do is segment my audience enough. I also didn't get opt-in, which I think is something that for anybody that's starting out or, you know, starting to get into this sort of thing, understanding what opt-in means um, as you get into using something like a HubSpot or a MailChimp. So I'd love uh, for folks to talk about uh, just what kind of CRM they're using, if they're happy with it, uh, just real briefly, if we can go around. Steve, you want to start that? Sure. Yeah. So great, great feedback so far. And, and, and you know, um, there in, in a couple of different parts of my life, I do use um, Salesforce, um, but I, I like, you know, and, and we talked about it being manual, but the manual, I, I'm not talking about pen and paper. I think we have a, gr a couple of really good tools uh, as a CRM. Uh, and, and that is number one, I think LinkedIn in a way can, can serve as a CRM. You know, it, it gives you the ability when somebody, there's a change uh, happening in their in their life, business life, right? Their job change or work anniversary or, you know, promotion, we get notified and you could use that to reach out. You know, that's a follow-up tool, right? Um, in addition to that, um, we have these great devices. I use an iPhone. It's a phenomenal device uh, that allows me to have a contact in my phone. I could put notes in it in the contact itself. And we have a calendar in that phone and, and that allows me to put events to myself for, for follow-up. And so I like the CRM. I, I think it's great. I like, you know, obviously sort of the sales for, you know, the sales, the, uh, the mail chimps and all those, but I, I don't, I, I don't want to lose the personal approach. I like the personal approach of, you know, when I'm, when I speak with somebody, I'm kind of getting a feel for what they're about, what their challenges and pain points. I'm taking notes. And then, and then I'll figure out what a good follow-up time is, right? And and I know there's there's again there's a couple of different ways we could look at this, right? Are we trying to you know blast out to a bunch of people and see who's interested, or are we developing long-term relationships and really connecting with people? And so that's the approach I take is really more utilizing the tools that we have, LinkedIn, the phone, to to really allow to to do a follow-up and follow through, and 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 maybe from a, from a text message saying, hey. Let's connect on a phone call, right? It's it's a, to me, it's a lot more personal. So that's that's my approach. I know that was a little more than what you you asked for, uh, Cam, but I wanted to no, at least all, chime in know, on that. And, and we got the the answer there in terms of like Salesforce, which I think is good. So if somebody's watching today or watching later, uh, and they got some questions about Salesforce, you're going to be a great person uh, for for them to reach out to and, and sort of contact, which is the goal uh, where I was trying to go. Um, I know. A couple of people wanted to jump in on this. Rob, you want to answer next? Sure. Thanks, Cameron. Yeah, and it sort of piggybacks on what um, what Steven just said. So I don't currently use a CRM. I'm open to one. I don't currently use one. So I'm more of a manual guy, much like uh, Steve said. No, it's not pen and paper. It's uh, tools available on our disposal. Yes, the iPhone is super powerful. It's got the calendars. It's got a lot of friendly apps uh, that integrate with like. Uh, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, uh, so you can use Google Docs and, and those stay live across you know, medium. Uh, so I use that in tandem with uh, just the reminders, asking this phone to remind me to call this client two weeks from now. So it's a little crude, it's a little basic, but these are powerful tools that uh, do certainly work. Uh, you do have to be disciplined. You can't let them fall by the wayside. So one of the things like I'm OCD, I don't like having any red on the phone. Uh, is I'll have these reminders pop up and it'll hold me accountable to follow up on those reminders. And that's really the key, keeping those Google Docs alive. 
uh, getting rid of the red, right? It makes sure that I get to it. It's, it's more manual, and I appreciate the automation that something like a CRM can bring. But for me, it, it goes it back to getting my, that on your calendar, fire, right? So uh, Chris, you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have a lot of experience with CRMs. Uh, my prior business, uh, went before I got into executive coaching and working with startups and so on, I used to use Salesforce. So Salesforce is a great tool, but it's 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 great for bigger organizations. So when I say bigger, you know, it could be 50, you know, maybe 25 minimum, 50 people. You don't need a CRM like that if you're a small uh, um, you know, business or you're a solopreneur. So something like a HubSpot is good. And I'm one of those people that I, again, I really connect with people based upon the value, again, number one, and what's important to them. So I'm not relying upon a CRM for the automation just to throw mud at a wall. I'm using it primarily for organizational reasons to track everything so I can record my conversations, track the time that I talk to them. And it's a reminder tool that when I do reach out to them manually, whether through LinkedIn or whatever channel I do, is that will keep me on track and knowing, knowing exactly what I you know said prior to the you know the last conversation that I had with them. So that's how I use HubSpot, and it serves me from where I'm at right now in in my business. So it really comes down to again what your business is, how many people you have involved in it. And again, you know, how you're connecting with them. So it, there could be a lot of different reasons. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Michael, do you use a CRM or? Yeah. Um, so again, for the context of being a real estate agent and I have a company uh, with multiple people, including assistants and other agents, CRMs are absolutely key uh, from the real estate business. Top three. Uh, number three would be Vulcan 7. It's a dialer and a CRM built in. Mm -hmm. Number two um, on that list. I'm writing it down. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, number two is follow up boss. Uh, is excellent. I used that for a while. And number one, I mean, it's just uh, it's been interesting. Um, I took what I wanted to have as a CRM, and when I moved uh, my business over to Compass, um, mm. with their CRM, which is awesome because you have an artificial intelligence piece. There's a lot going on there when you start adding AI to CRMs predictive analytics, different things are popping up every single day, um, and the interconnect the interconnectedness of the entire country at our disposal is a really powerful CRM. I also am an investor, so I also have a, uh, a restaurant. I own a, a restaurant nightclub, and I also own other investment properties and buildings and different things like that. So with the other businesses, um, as far as restaurants and different things like that, you don't necessarily need those kinds of CRMs, I think there's definitely some more business CRMs out there um, that I think some of the other uh, panelists brought up that are excellent. I love that. And I, I love the, the, the restaurant aspect because I got a background in hospitality and it brings in mind like Danny Meyer and the way that you deal with customers and the follow up and the experience itself and the follow up afterwards. I think there's there's a lot there. Um, Keith, um, I want to get to you just to uh, close this out and then I want to answer uh, Paula's uh, question here. I'll throw that back up on the screen in a, in a second. But what do you use a CRM, mostly manual? Uh, no, absolutely a CRM. I, I've been working uh, helping companies get those built into their their sales process for years. Um, worked at Apple and had you know a, a daily routine around it uh, 10, 15 years ago. So it's it's uh, really important. The one thing I'd say is to scale it to your business, but uh, more importantly, create an experience for your customers that you want. So uh, I did a pretty exhaustive study this summer, was going was leaning towards HubSpot. And then I decided to go with SharpSpring because I liked their partner model. And I found a partner that was comfortable to me who listened to what I wanted to accomplish, right? So it's how do I want to keep track of people, uh, the companies they work for, the opportunities that we have before us? How do we organize and categorize them so that I can share it with my team? Um, once you start getting beyond yourself, it's really important to do it, uh, to, to go to some tool. And um, we're, we're, you know, small and growing and we wanted to invest ahead of the curve because I knew that's where I want my company to go. So think for the future would be my last piece and be willing to kind of uh, step up to something a little bit above your, your punching uh, weight if that's where you want to be in the future. Yeah, I think that's a great message. And that's definitely where I was going with that, like learning about opting in and stuff is like, listen, you may not be ready for it now, but you should definitely understand how to sort of as you're building customers in 
um, build the funnel before you need even need the funnel, right? You know, you may not be able to afford, you might not be ready for these tools, but thinking about the future. All right, uh, let's get to Paula's question. And while I'm answering Paula's question, just wanted to shout out uh, Mahana. Um, she said she uses Salesforce pretty organized. Thanks for uh, Oscar and uh, Tabona and uh, uh, so many people checking in. We really appreciate you watching. Paula says, how often should you follow up? I had two interviews at a restaurant to be the head bartender and run the bar program. I was told that I was definitely being brought back for a third and final interview. I sent a thank you email saying that I was very interested in the general manager and human resources, no response. A week later, I followed up and once again, no response. And I love this, this question because we're, I think all sort of talking about, you know, uh, business uh, to the client and she's talking about you know, really looking for that that job opportunity. And it's a little bit different, but it's it's a little bit of the same thing in terms of, you know, how how wide are we throwing our net? Are we going after one specific customer or a whole bunch of a, a bunch of customers? Are we going after one specific employer, a whole bunch of employers? And what is the appropriate amount of follow-up? How do you how do you decide that um, in your process? You know, do you have a a method for figuring out when I should not be uh, bothering this contact anymore, right? Uh, who wants to jump in on that? Um, I can jump in. If, I, if I answer Paula's oh, question, looking for, I guess she's looking to get a job here. Fen, and, I'll, uh, Fen, I'll get you right after that. Chris. All right, Fen, Chris, go ahead. Okay, no, you sure. I, I, it's fine either way. All right. So just to, to get to her question, again, you know, you followed up twice. As long as that you were very specific and clear about your intentions, that you're interested in the job, you kind of outlined what was discussed, what they're looking for, and again, that what, why and what you can do to match and exceed that. As long as you did that, following up twice, I think is fine. A lot of times what happens is we may get the, re the results that we seek when we, again, let, we have to let go. Sometimes we can only control what we can but we have to learn how to let go of what we can't. There could be a multitude of reasons why they haven't gotten back. Maybe something got put on hold, another priority it got put into place, uh, the, you know, Thanksgiving weekend here, whatever the case may be. So I would say that if you haven't heard anything in the next week or two, maybe two weeks, you could do another uh, follow-up. But if you, if you, you know, do it like every other day or every few days, I think it would be overkill. I think in today's world, People want really, really like people that follow up at a certain point are very specific and clear with what their side and what their intention is and what they're looking for. As long as you've done that, just let that go. And if you haven't heard anything in another week or so that you can do another touch just to see what happens then. Go ahead, Fenn. That's, that's really good advice uh, from Chris. And at, uh, on the on the flip side of that, because I spent seven years in the mortgage industry, and uh, you know you have a very like attack dog, you know, down boy, you know, kind of mindset. Um, but what I said in the beginning is nobody really cares about you, and I know that sounds really harsh, but I try to be a realist. There are other people who are vying for your position, whether it's a position at a job, whether it's a client that you're trying to get. There are other people who are trying to be where you want to be. And I feel like if you're not doing all that you can to squeeze them out and get there, somebody else is going to close the sale, whether that's a client or a job. The other thing is that um, when you don't take it personally, you realize, you know what, that might work out. It might not, but I'm going to go after something else. You know, my day is just filled with, exploring opportunities and getting in front of as many people as I can. And while I do care and I do put effort and thought and consideration into nurturing the relationships that I do have, I'm constantly trying to develop new ones because you also don't know what's going to pop uh, when, when it's going to pop, like Chris said. So yeah, that's I my say, uh, response are, to Paula. You guys are saying so much good stuff, but related to Paula, she says, I have, I've also had excellent <clears> reference. And that's what I was thinking about when, um, the response was coming in about in terms of the length is like maybe it's not about when but it's about what right the content of that follow-up what are you saying in that 
And how are you you coming off as impressive? How are you making yourself an irresistible candidate? I think for folks that are following up with their connections, you know, I think there's a, a especially um, <clears throat> there's a talent to, to following up with somebody and bragging or you know you know tooting your own horn to a certain level where you're not coming off as um egotistical but you're sort of saying hey i'm involved in this this is you know this is you know what i'm doing this is why i might be somebody that you uh would like to be involved in you know what uh, right can, with. can i add one thing to this absolutely so uh, I, I really applaud Paula for you know digging in and trying to find the way to be um, a, a persistent without being perceived as aggressive. But you know research shows that it takes uh, up to eight uh, or the optimum. I think the optimum um, number of follow-ups is eight that close a sale, and so you shouldn't let your own insecurities uh, hold you back. Uh, also, you have somebody on the inside, and so you actually have a team member to work with on this. So showing up and being of value to that company that you want to work for uh, in involves how you work in a group and as a team and how you uh, interact politically and interpersonally with people. So keep working your network. Um, uh, you don't want to be in their face every day, but you also want to have a process where you're following up. The last thing I'll add is the more opportunities you have in your pipeline, the less important any one individual lead becomes. Oh, I think that's huge. Right. I think that's, I think that's like, let's drop a bomb. Like that's the, that's, that's the, the mic value dropper. All day, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, I think that, you know, I don't know if you've seen this thing circulating around where, uh, the dad gives his son his car. He tells him, go to the, the dealership and then take it to the auto club. And the dealership offers him this small amount of money. And he takes it to the auto club and it happens to be, you know, a, a collector's item. And they, they offer him a ton of money. And the, and the point there being go where you're valued, um, you know, really uh, strikes a big bell. You know, find that place where you're going to be valued. Um, and so to Paula and to anybody that's looking for a client or a job opportunity, that idea of going where you are valued is always big. And I'd love to kind of throw it out there in terms of what we're talking about. Like, how do you, how do you follow up with the people that are valuable versus, you know, casting that net and then, you know, getting some, sort of time wasting things if somebody wants to jump in there. Uh, Mahana says, Paul, if they don't respond, perhaps they don't deserve you and their organization, better opportunities away. So that goes to that that value uh, uh, piece. All right, guys. Hey, Cameron, if I could, I'd love to, yeah, to Steph, jump please. in here. Sure. So, so, and Paul, it's interesting enough, her and I had this conversation. So, um, but I agree with what Keith said and that in a lot of what everyone has said, but especially what Keith said, uh, number one, uh, multiple touches, right? Um, you know, my, my methodology is I will continue to follow up, not every week necessarily, but I'll follow up until they say, basically, leave me alone, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and, and that almost never happens, right? Um, the other thing I would also recommend, it, you know, for anyone listening, not just for you, Paula, is it's important in that first meeting when you do get somebody live, right, to find out what their what the timing is of the next step, right? If because if you, sometimes we have a tendency to rush off and we don't get that, you have you find out the next step, and then I will also say, hey, so if I don't hear back from you by such and such, um, I, I assume I'll just give you a call, okay? You know, get a kind of buy-in on that, right? So I've got permission from them to follow up again. Um, but I'm going to continue to follow up. You know, I might make a cadence, you know, maybe it's once a week to once every three weeks to maybe once every three, two months, you know, but, but I, I will never stop. Um, but I agree also with what Keith said. So you dropped a lot of good nuggets and that is, but that's not your only opportunity, right? You're, you're working all of the other opportunities as well. Um, but, but continue to press forward. And I think that's a, that's an important part, part of this. And, Cameron, I don't know if there's another question that I was supposed to address, but I, I wanted to just chime in on that one. I love that. And I love the getting permission to follow up. You know, it speaks to the opt in. It also speaks to how you can stay involved in somebody's network the right way, because if they're saying, yes, I want to hear from you, that makes it a whole lot easier than uh, trying to figure that out. Go ahead, Rob. 
Yeah, so thanks, Cam. I just want to add one point to this. <clears throat> and as dealing with somebody, as somebody who deals in a business that is, could be a very long sales cycle, um, relevance is super important, right? And I've seen this from both perspectives, both the job hunt and the client hunt. Um, how relevant is it to the client? Meaning, okay, on the client side, if that client is two years out, I could contact them, I don't know, seven more times before sundown. It's not relevant yet. They're not there yet. So whether you're pursuing a job or a client, you know, as that time kind of ticks away and you, you haven't gotten a response back, you'll come up with a thousand different reasons in your head, all of which are probably wrong, why they haven't gotten back to you. And it's all this head trash building up. It may just not be relevant yet. So in the case of a job, they may just not be ready for you yet. Um, I've, again, I've seen that on both sides. So that's just the last piece I wanted to add to this. That's great. If I could add something about that relevance, because I think that's uh, a key, yeah. a really key point that you bring up. Um, and what I've tried to do with my career over the last 10 years is, is how do you build content into that? So part of who you are is what you share with people and thinking like an editor and thinking of people out there. And I'm really talking about sales and marketing organizations, but I think it also applies to if you're, uh, looking for a job and you're looking to head up a program for a company is share your expertise in a way that helps that person that you're looking to make a decision, see you as a leader and somebody who can add value. So whether you, you are scanning the news and you, and you see a, a feature article that talks about, you know, something that you believe in and you just wanted to follow up on, on the, last time you spoke and share this, uh, or it's part of your regular blogging and it's part of your content strategy, just be mindful of what you share with people because it's a real uh, a way to shorten the, 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 the con concept that you're trying to get across, right? It's, it, and it can be helpful to them. That's great. Um, Mahenna didn't ask a question, but I, I sort of this sort of gets into something she says she's in business development for a national plan and following up takes most of her time what do you gentlemen recommend in terms of spending more time on the value piece of follow-up and less time on the nuts and bolts of follow-up now i know we've talked about crm but is there something that you would suggest to somebody that's that's spending a lot of time on following up to shorten the amount of time um, that you're doing on the actual chasing things down and more on the valuable connections that lead to sales and value yeah i, I can i just put this is my area that I, I coach people on it's 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 position yourself as an influencer and when we talk about an influencer it's not you're looking to persuade someone to see your point of view or that they should be buying your product, so to speak. It's putting out information that empowers them to draw their own conclusion. If you're looking for a sustainable model to build a, a, you know, a customer into a long-term client and then one that will refer you going forward, they have to make that decision from within. Not that they were just sold on it because they're always gonna maybe have one foot in, one foot out. They have to be able to buy on conviction based on they know they need it, they know this could help them, and they know they have a part in it because here's the reality. There is no product or service out there that is going to solve anybody's problem in itself. It's a two way street. That person has to use it in order to solve their challenge or problem. So if we can, if you can use content in between when you're nurturing that relationship with the follow up, again, finding uh, different areas where those people are interacting with content to be in front of them in some way being compelling. I found that to be very helpful, not only in my own business, but many of the clients that I've worked with in terms of building a, 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 an influence factor, but in this case, that you're empowering people to make their own decisions. You're not persuading them and doing that for them, so to speak. So I find that works very well long-term, maybe not necessarily short-term, but again, long-term. Yeah, absolutely. Steve, I know you want to jump in on this. Yeah, absolutely. And Chris, that's some great stuff there. You know, um, I made a video earlier today um, on gratitude and, and sort of headspace. And so all I want to say, and this is for Paula, this is for any of the, the listeners here, the viewers, you know, 
it, it's all kind of your perspective, right? I had a, a good friend of mine, Bill Shulman, say say to me say to me this maybe six seven years ago. He said, "You've got some great value, and this is not about Steve Spiro. This is about anyone listening. You've got great value. You know, you're an asset. You bring a lot to the table. So when you go there, and when you're when you're reaching out, whether it be first time or follow up, or many times multiple follow ups, understand that they need you. It's not you need them. They need you. And so, uh, you, if you go in with that perspective, that headspace, I think it's really going to." to help you here in, in, in feeling less like you're begging, but like, Hey, uh, and, and you know, it's okay to sometimes take it away too. You know, you could, you could say, Hey, you know, I know I've, I've called a couple of times. Um, you know, honestly, I, I might need to, you know, take another opportunity or, um, and I, I, I liked you guys so much. I just wanted to make sure you had an opportunity, uh, you know, to connect with me before I that, made that decision, you know, and, and that's okay. You, but you need to keep your dignity, keep, you know, self-respect, but more so understand your value and, and make sure you feel that not just in your words, but in your heart, in your headspace. So that's what, um, what I wanted to share. I love that. And before I, I let Fenton jump in here, I think there's something to be said about the psychology of, you know, and, and, and we all want to be kind. We all want to be uh, generous in our language, but there's a big difference between me saying, hey, please, can you like this thing? And Hey, like this, this is something it's, it's a subtle difference, but when we understand when each is appropriate, right. And I think it gets to that idea of, you know, whether this is something that, you know, I, it, you're doing them a favor or they're, they're being presented a favor by speaking to you. They're being presented a favor by being a part of something. It's a subtle difference, but it really makes a difference. And, and people, are attracted to confidence and there's a certain language of confidence that goes into it. So if you go into the language, you know, into the conversation confidently, you're probably going to get better results. Go ahead, Fenton. I, I love that. That's really great. And I, I love everything that Chris and Steve said. Uh, and I, I don't want to be redundant, but I really feel like, you know, people have this misconception that the headspace of the client, you know, that they're shooting for or whatever is, is already dominated. And I really think that it's not. I, I think that the bar is really low when it comes to dominating people's headspace simply by doing what Chris said, which is putting out content. Uh, you know, for me, I use LinkedIn as a CRM. I had to chuckle to myself and think about it. You've been asking how to, what you, CRM do we use. You know, LinkedIn really is a great CRM for me because I can speak to somebody. Maybe it seems like it's lukewarm. But I'm putting out content where I'm positioning myself as a subject matter expert and as an authority. And I can see that they're interacting with that content. They're liking it. Maybe they're sharing it. And over time, I've had clients that I thought eh, it might have been on the fence. But they've consumed my content and they came over to my side and we're able to close. You know, just being your authentic, memorable expert self, because everyone's an expert at whatever it is that they do to some degree, um, and and sharing that with the world. I, I wish people would take a moment to get over their insecurities and stop worrying about what you sound like on video and how you look in your left eye is bigger than your right eye and whatever, and just put that content out there and let it work for you. Yeah, absolutely. It goes to that influencer comment. It's certainly been my strategy over the last few months. I want people to come and and find my business, not me having to search out. So putting yourself out there, you if you're the biggest uh, brand on the street, people are going to come and find you. Um, I know, Rob, you want to jump into this. Yeah, just real quick, it kind of dovetails into what was said. Um, and it ties into what Steve said about your headspace and having the right mindset. Um, you know very well the value that you're bringing to the equation and why this client or COI or, or uh, interviewer needs you, right? So be very deliberate in your language. As Chris said, be true to yourself. That's super key. That's the cornerstone of everything you do. But be deliberate in your language. Case being, uh, when you're doing emails or texts, drop the word just. Don't say, hey, just circling back or hey, just wanted to see where you were at. No, I'm following up. We had a great conversation last time. We're two weeks out where you stand. So be deliberate in your, in your language and in your conversations. Own that headspace, as Steve said, because that's everything at the end yeah. of the day. Go ahead and jump in, Keith. Um, so kind of back to the idea of the CRM, um, 
it, it's really important that you build that into your routine, that it's reminding you uh, to follow up, but equally importantly is to build it out so that your follow-up process is programmed. You can send very personal emails in a scheduled way because lead nurturing as a practice is all about helping you focus on the things that are at the bottom of the sales funnel where you have using this influence that you have it is where you can really make the biggest impact is on closing the sale. And so the things that you do at the top of the funnel, you want to automate and the things that you do at the bottom of the funnel, you want to make highly personal, but it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice personal messaging when you automate three, five or seven emails that go out over the next six or eight weeks. Uh I think that's amazing. And, and Christopher, we just dropped a um, uh, comment into the chat here. Christopher said, um, limiting beliefs established from childhood affect your level of confidence and how you relate to yourself and others. This shows up in your communication with others. Address the problem first to raise your level of confidence over time to operate within the solution free from limiting beliefs. And I think that's really important for anybody trying to follow up because if you're getting in your own way, if you're roadblocking yourself with your own language and your own confidence level, that's that's huge. You'll see much better results with your follow-up if you're not uh, limiting yourself in your language and, and even in the whether or not to choose to actually uh, commit on that and follow up. Um, and, I, and I noticed uh, people's heads uh, nodding to that and everything. So I wanted to get in there. Uh, Keith, go ahead, jump in here. I think, I think oh, it was no, maybe yeah, me, sorry, right? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Keith had some great nuggets he I dropped as well. Um, I, I'm just going to, you know, and, and I, obviously what Keith, what, what Keith, you said is great, and, and I, I need to really take a serious look at CRM better, but I'm going to talk about what Fenton referred to as the LinkedIn as being our CRM, and I'll tell a story that kind of backs what, what, what Fenton spoke of. Um, I was working in a, in a, in a uh, HR related industry for a little while, and I was trying to um, get a deal move forward. And quite frankly, I was having trouble and I was calling and messaging and nothing. And uh, so, and, but I was smart enough, which hopefully I believe every one of the panelists here are doing this, right? When you have the ability, you're going to reach out and connect with somebody on LinkedIn. And so she and I were connected on LinkedIn. And I was posting about some of the things that I believed in, in terms of mentorship. And so she reached out to me uh, through LinkedIn and she said, hey, I'd love to, you know, have lunch. I'd love to pick your brains. Uh, you talked about mentorship. I have some career challenges and some things I need to I need to really figure out. Would you be willing to have lunch? I said, sure. And guess what? You know, we, we talked about some of those things. I helped her a little bit, give us some perspective. But guess what? I found out the answer. We had a great conversation. The focus was really helping her, but at the tail end of the conversation, I said, "Hey, no, we were, you know, we were looking at doing this. You know, anything I could help." And she had a total mis mis misperception of what uh, our offerings were. I clarified it, and within a few weeks, I had, uh, I had a, a, a new deal. So through content posting on LinkedIn, that opened up a door so that I could actually, uh, you know, get a deal closed. So hopefully, that story helps inspire somebody out there. That's amazing, Steve. All right, so I want to get to a place where we're, we're providing tremendous value for you. So I want to put out a sort of a scenario um, that may be familiar to a lot of folks out there. Um, people's businesses obviously affected by the current environment of pandemic. Their business may be changing uh, from what it was before, they may be shut down, they may be in uh, hibernation mode. How would you suggest for businesses that are in that sort of phase right now where they're waiting for the world to kind of come back, how would you suggest for them to be following up with their customers so that when things open up again, they are ready and they're front of mind with their customers? Who wants to jump in on that? Mm. Go ahead, Fenton. Yeah, I think the first thing I would say is that you need to be okay with the fact that you are a for-profit organization. And uh, if you're not following up with people, which is a part of what you do, you know, whether it's prospecting or moving leads uh, down the funnel, 
um, then you're doing yourself a disservice and you're also doing your clients a disservice. You know, you, you have to reconcile the fact that even though a lot of the world isn't in a good place, there are a lot of people that still are um, and you're still providing value. You know, just because we're in a pandemic doesn't mean that you're not able to provide value to people. Um, that was a big deal for me. You know, when things shut down, my motto was the Internet's open for business. I understand that brick and mortar may have shut down, but I'm a web designer. <laughs> so a lot of people are moving to the Internet. And I was, quite frankly, in attack mode with empathy, of course. And, you know, you know, definitely handling cases with kid gloves because you don't want to offend anybody. But from being honest, I didn't come across a single person who received a call from me or an email and responded uh, as if I were, you know, not being sensitive to the fact that they or to the possibility that they might not be in a position to buy. Um, if anything, people were extremely appreciative of the fact that I reached out just to see how they were doing, um, because it's all about people first. And if the opportunity presented itself to take a deeper dive into business, then great. If not, that's great as well. That's great. Yeah. I think it's really important too, uh, especially with digital marketing, have that website presence. You're in that business where people really need to be aware. Like it's going to be hard to be in front of people if you don't have a way to be in front of people. Uh, I was came across a guy that's in the copy business and he doesn't have a website and I'm sitting there linking like, how do you, how do you stay in front of people if you don't have some sort of web presence? All right. Uh, who else wants to jump in on this? I was gonna. I was just gonna say uh, to Fenton's point. You made a great point. It's it's leveraging your strengths during this time to be that example, to be the value to people. They may not be in a position to buy right now, but if you're out there giving without expectation and be always open to receive without resistance, you have to access those strengths. So if you are a great writer and that's your thing, then you should be out there writing articles, blogging, putting out uh, contextual content, things that are adding value indirectly or directly. I'm a speaker. I'm also, I train as well. So now I can't do that in person right now. I can't be out there on a stage, but yet what I can do is I can be doing it virtually. So I do a lot of virtual events and a lot of times you're, you're putting out content that again, empowers the audience, your audience to draw their own conclusion. You are nurturing them through that. Why not necessarily why you do what you do to you, but why is it important to them? That's what ultimately comes down to it. And then using those platforms that play to those strengths to do that. Now, if there's other platforms that go that don't play to your strengths, let's say you need better website presence and you can't design a website. Well, then you offset that weakness to someone who can like Fenton, who can do that. And that's it. You, you, you find a way to leverage your strengths, offset your weaknesses and provide something that is going to be a value for that client. So when the time comes and they're ready, they're going to remember you, not the person that had been just trying to sell them or just contacting them to contact them. Yeah, beautiful. And really, really quick, just, I just, I'm sorry. I just want to say this. One of the things that I did, cause Chris said this, I gave people advice on how to update their own websites. I gave people advice on how to manage their own social media. If you can't afford me, here are some free tips that you can get on my website or my social media on how to take your own thing to the next level. Yeah, that value piece can't speak highly enough about providing value to people, making yourself a resource. Uh, go ahead, Keith, and then uh, Michael, and then we'll have some uh, closing out statements. So I think one of the most important things you can do with any customer is ask them how you can help and, um, and give away value in that conversation. Um, and, and so that's when people open up when you have a transparency about you and they know that you're there to help. Um, the, the other thing I think it's really important is to, you know, think about things that you're doing to project yourself on the internet, because it's not about you and what you're trying to say. It's more about how you're being perceived and you want to have an authenticity and a consistency so that when people find you on your website and your LinkedIn and your Facebook and wherever they're going to look for you, and trust me, they will, right? After you have an initial meeting or if you're reconnecting with somebody, they're gonna research you, especially if they're bringing you into an organization because they know that their colleagues, uh, that, that they're going to bring you into a conversation with their colleagues are going to look. So you really have to sort of do a 360 about yourself and, uh, if you if you can't 
do it by yourself, then, you know, friends and family can help or work with a professional, a coach or a consulting firm. Um, and that that goes from the individual all the way up to a company with 50 salespeople or more. Or more. Michael, jump in here. Um, everybody on the panel is awesome. Uh, pages and pages of notes. Uh, I think for, again, just to give everything context, because I knew we were going to have like a very high level conversation today with people in different businesses. Um, I break it down like this and I, and I try to keep it simple. Um, it's all about attention. So you can't ask anybody to take an actionable or do an actionable item like engage in your post, click on your website, put in your information, go to whatever, buy this thing, call you until you can start with getting the attention. So, and just like a lot of people have commented, talked about, there's good attention, then there's bad attention, right? And I think we all know the difference. The good attention is the stuff that basically does uh, info selling, which is basically where you can entertain, because I find that um, being able to entertain the audience gets their attention, and then you can give them the information that provides you to be the authority figure, and then you can ask them, once you've gained the trust or have given them enough of authority in the area that they want a solution for, then they can engage in an actionable item like clicking this link or go to that Facebook page or find out this information and put in that, uh, that stuff. So we're all at the, the first beginning part, we are all marketers to start. And there is a little bit of an art to being hired for something, right? To be really, really good at gaining somebody's trust and being an authority um, whether that's trying to get a job as the uh, as the head of the bar, or it's to be hired to sell a ten million dollar penthouse, or to be given an entire marketing division of somebody's firm, whatever. There's a, there's an art to be able to do that. And most of it, for what we're kind of talking about, is how do you start at the very very beginning of getting somebody to go from who doesn't know you to now they see you to then taking the actionable item of engaging with you to then they become somebody you can talk to and then they become a client and then a past client and a referral business partner. That whole thing starts with getting attention in your space where you're an authority. And if you don't know how to do that through the media today, through social platforms, because you can't always drive to people's offices or their business or their house and do that, that's the key. Um, and that I think if you can, it, and I, I take a lot of where I get, I don't mean to go too long on this, but I take a lot as far as the media marketing side, because so much of my business is being able to create media and marketing specifically for a target audience, putting it into that target audience platform, how they consume the, the marketing and then getting it to convert on a sale. Um, understanding the, the science and, and art to creating that content that engages them on that platform and doing that without being annoying, that is the beautiful, beautiful part. And that is where being a marketer and looking at how big, big companies who do Super Bowl ads, sometimes advertisements that entertain, provide them as the authority, but never even say who they are. And you gotta wait to the end of commercials sometimes to even realize who these people are. That's, this is all what we do. Get attention, then you can start the funnel that way. Sorry, you mute again. The um, really important point there, the entertainment aspect of what you do in the follow up. One of the great things that I've learned over the past few months uh, from being on calls and going around the room is one of the favorite emails that people like to receive is a funny video, which blew my mind because, you know, you got comments like, oh, I like getting that email that says they signed off in the business, but people enjoy receiving the humor and the side of it. So making the light life. And of course, we're getting uh, some some last minute questions here. Uh, I know some people have to go. So uh, I'm cool to, to stay on. Steve, are you OK for, uh, staying on for a couple of minutes? Sure, I could stay a couple. All right. Of so I know Absolutely. Steve came up before, but before anybody jumps off, I just want to say thank you, gentlemen, so much. Uh, for being on here today. I think we've provided a ton of value. Uh, YouTube link uh, will be live. I'll send that to everybody to share out. So this information will be live on the internet to Fenton's point in terms of curating and finding things um, that, that can bring people to your brand. Um, I just wanted to give everybody the opportunity to say goodbye to the audience. Well, me and Steve are definitely staying on. Anybody else is welcome to stay on. We have some questions uh, from uh, J. Arthur Peralta, 
and uh, Mahana has some stuff. So we'll, we'll jump into that. But I just want to give everybody an opportunity to say goodbye. Anybody got to jump off right now? I can stay. All right. Everybody's good. Great stuff. Right. It's going so well. Everyone's just <laughs> All, right. All, right. All right. So Jay Arthur Perot says, how does your personal brand influence the quality of attention you're getting from customers? And how can you properly leverage that to improve the quality of attention, be perceived as an expert or authority when displaying content? Who wants to jump in on that? I would say, um, yeah, it's it's very important. Again, we you know, and some a lot of people have put this out there. Fenton said it a few times. There's a lot of noise out there, right? There's there's a lot of people that do what you do already. So it's not that you're doing anything unique. It's again why you do what you do. So when you're putting out content that plays in in my case, I put out content that plays to values that are true to me and true to the people that I want to do business with or want to coach, consult with, and so on. So I, I know that I'm never going to be everything for everyone as a brand. So I look to be the, 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 the go-to person for the people that we relate on those values. And it's, and it's got, and I got to connect with them based on that. So they feel that there's some level of trust that they feel that I relate and understand them on some level, even though I may have not even had a conversation or I've only talked to them one time. So it's that consistency with that content that indirectly builds your brand. I built a brand strictly from scratch, nothing, just social media on LinkedIn, Facebook, strictly from posting content that added value daily and that people would wake up and it was like their morning cup of coffee. They got some, some, you know, some wisdom that they could decide what they wanted to do with it. And so you have to decide what that is with you and how you want to build your brand, but knowing that it's about them, what's compelling to them, not necessarily what makes you unique first. People don't care what makes you unique until you give them a reason why what is compelling to them. That uniqueness will come in time with that consistency with being compelling. Love that. Great. Who else wants to jump in? Cameron, would, I, would you mind me taking it? Yeah, go ahead, go. So, so you know, so I know, I know, author uh, Peralta there, uh, and uh, he gets my my uh, my mindset a bit. So, um, cool uh, that you're, you're tuning in there, sir. But yeah, I mean, so a lot of what what um, uh, what Michael said um, and a lot of Christopher said really resonates for me, right? And and I know uh, Madeline asked about authenticity or vulnerability, so it all kind of blends in. For, number one, I think putting out content that's reflective of who you are and your identity, your, not your identity, but your authenticity, right? And if that means being vulnerable, it's, you're vulnerable, right? Um, you know, you guys know I do the Friday Fridays. I, I do it typically on one take. And if I stumble a little bit, so what, right? It's okay. I am who I am, right? And we got to be comfortable within our own skin and, 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 and believe uh, and, 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 sh and show that. Um, but I do want to talk about the, the the whole COVID thing a little bit. It was, it was talked about earlier because I think there's a way to get a message out. And yes, there's sort of an entertainment value. But I think I think people I, think, I want to believe that people are tired of the of the bad news and the gloom and doom. So I try to make my message. And again, this is my authentic message. Maybe not everybody's, but a, a message of inspiration, right? I think COVID has been in some ways. Yes, it's been tragic for some people. But it's been a blessing. It's really opened up doors in many different ways. It's pushed technology forward, pushed us into places we know we should have been. You know, we were talking about being a paperless society. We were talking about, you know, remote working. And we we're talking about all these things. And, and it was just and, and this comes along and, and, and now we are. Right. And, you know, being able to communicate better now with, through technology. Right. Um, so I, I think that. It's kind of a mixed mass message, what I'm saying here, but I want to say that getting out your message, a message of inspiration, um, and, and I think once you get that out, I think you want you and, and it reflects your personal brand, people want to do business with you. So that's my take on kind of a little bit of, of what was said and, and Arthur's question. Beautiful. All right, Keith, go ahead. Uh, yeah, w one thing that I'd encourage everybody to do is have somebody that's not you talk to some of your customers and find out how they describe you and use that to help you build a, a, a digital presence that's in alignment. So we just worked with a customer 
Uh, he's got several employees. They uh, actually do work in, in the uh, marketing automation CRM space. And what their customers loved about them is that they were a coach. And they, they what constantly got described about them was how helpful and involved they were in the business and how it was like having a coach to help them succeed uh, with their lead nurturing. And that infused everything that we did to help them recreate their, their brand online. And we used language about coaching and we came up with a playbook. So, you know, there's ways to get creative about this but it's very hard to do within your own bubble. So reach out to other people and get their perspective. Beautiful. Um, that's really good. And I, I feel like I hate to be redundant, but you know, my wife doesn't know much about what I do in terms of like the technology and stuff like that. So she's the person that I always ask about what I do great. and how it's perceived. She's just a straight up customer. And, um, you know, I have friends and associates that are business owners. I'll call them and, and give them a pitch, you know, uh, hey, let me let me do a sales call with you and tell me how I sound. Um, we, we need to do more of that. We need to do more sales training. Um, we need to do more, uh, you know, cold, not necessarily cold call training. Again, that's that mortgage mindset. But you do need to understand how you're being perceived and then start to first accept that reality that this is who people actually think you are because that's what your brand is, right? Your marketing is um, the message that you put out and you're saying, this is who I am, this is who I am. But your brand is what other people think that you are, regardless of what you say. So you need to get a good feel for the lay of that land before you can, you know, that could greatly impact your follow-up. Maybe you're not making the impression that you think that you're making. Uh, might be better to ask your friends and family <laughs> than to lose a, a prospect. All right, Fenton. So while, while I got you speaking, go ahead and tell people where they can find you. And then we'll kind of go round robin around the room since you're in the center. Absolutely. Well, my company is Olive Branch Digital. So you can find me at olivebranchdigital.com and Olive Branch Digital on all social media platforms. All right, go ahead, Chris. Uh, name of my company is CRS Group Holdings, LLC, but we go under my brand, Christopher Salem. So it's uh, ChristopherSalem.com, or you can reach out to me on my uh, email at Chris at ChristopherSalem.com, of course, LinkedIn. Amazing. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, Michael uh, at LLARealEstate.com. Website is LLARealEstate.com. Instagram is Michael Ferraro CT, um, and they can just Google my name. Uh, anytime you want or email me beautiful 1031 rob <laughs> this is really hard to remember 1031 rob.com has all my contact information there look forward to connecting <laughs> go ahead keith yeah so um it's keith reynolds and uh, my company is publio and we help companies come up and with and ex execute their content strategy which is uh, uh a, a book that uh, you can find on Amazon uh, to help get the concepts out there. You can Google Keith Reynolds and the new content culture and look at my website, which I put in the, uh, in the chat box, Publio, P-U-B-L-I.io. And if you have any questions, we'd love to help. Beautiful. My name is Cameron Toth. I host BizDev Live Networking Tuesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. And you can see me every day on YouTube, BizDev Live. You can search that on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, Steve, go ahead, close us out and say goodbye to everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, from your co-host, Cameron. Thank you so much for being here. I'll let Steve close it out. Yeah, this was an incredible panel. Uh, everybody, thank you. Thank you so much for being on here. I think we had a lot of value to everybody. Uh, everyone that's on watching this is, is, is connected with me on LinkedIn, so you can message me if you want to. So no issues with that. Um, but uh, looking forward to doing this again next Friday. We'll be on with another topic, uh, two o'clock again. Uh, highly recommend check out the two the twelve uh, the Tuesday at, at twelve with Cameron. Uh, it's an it's an awesome, very different kind of networking experience. Uh, but this was great, folks. Uh, enjoy the the rest of the weekend. Really uh, glad, Cameron. It's awesome having you as a co-host. I could not have done this by myself. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, My thank pleasure. you, thank you. Appreciate everybody. See you soon. Have a great weekend. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Stay safe.
Are we off? We are on. I just want to say goodbye to everybody. Steve, it's always a pleasure.